with us uh, to yet another uh, big development, ladies and gentlemen. Days after the Punch terror attack and ahead of the SCO summit, External Affairs Minister Subramaniam Jaishankar calling out the terrorism activities that India's neighbors have continued to indulge in terror acts against India. S. Jaishankar on a two-day state visit to Panama addressed a joint press briefing and said that it's very difficult to engage with a neighbor who practices cross-border terrorism against India. Dr. Jaishankar added that India does not sponsor or carry out terror activities and hopes to reach the same stage with its neighbors. This is the third time this year that Dr. Jaishankar has slammed Pakistan for cross-border terrorism. Bottom line on this issue is uh, that it is for us very difficult to engage with a neighbor uh, who practices cross-border terrorism uh, against us. Uh, we have always said that they have to deliver on their commitment uh, not to encourage, sponsor and carry out cross-border terrorism. We continue to hope that one day uh, we would uh, reach that stage. Just as, you know, a country has to fix its uh, economic issues, a country has to fix its political issues too. A country has to fix its social issues. You know, I mean, you c no country is ever going to come out of a difficult situation and become a prosperous power if its basic industry is terrorist. I think epicenter is a very diplomatic word because this is a country which has attacked uh, the parliament of India some years ago, which attacked the city of Mumbai, which went after hotels and foreign tourists, which every day sends uh, terrorists across the uh, border. If you uh, control your sovereign space, which I believe they do, uh, if the terrorist camps operate in broad daylight in cities with recruitment and financing, uh, can you really tell me that the Pakistani state doesn't know what's going on? And to the exclusive information, our investigations editor Manoj Gupta getting us these details where Intel sources are telling News 18 that Lashkar's desperation is out. Fund management pressure to collect funds after Pakistan was pressure, uh, pressured by the FATF. Variants of the terror group have been banned globally. There is a fight for relevance and this group has gone dark after the ISI ordered to join Taliban. There is a pressure to show strength to stay relevant in Pakistan itself for the lashkar e -Taiba. Leadership change. There is a fight for takeover of the reins after Hafiz Saeed's arrest. Khalid bin Walid, also known as Khalid Naik's need to position himself, is coming to the fore. The funds for politics on the 18th of March 2023, the Lashkar relaunched their political party. And their fund collection is actually going slow. There is no money among the people. Financiers are being, uh, are being forced to be nudged. International help is also not coming. There is a change of guard in POK. And the change of PM in, prime, in POK is actually giving impetus to Lashkar over Jaish. So there is this one-upmanship game that is happening up over Taliban. It also depending on ISI for uh, local Mujahideen and the need for local Mujahideen to unleash terror. There is a bit to show capability as Pak Taliban with such an attack. So a lot of these aspects stand out, ladies and gentlemen. There is a kacha op, this was a retaliation because the Pakistan army has hampered LED's operations in Punjab, Sindh. So there are a uh, lot of attacks which are being unleashed to put Pakistan in a corner internationally. So these are what sources are saying in terms of Lashkar's desperation. SP, where the former J DGP JNK is with us, so is Ambassador Rajiv Dogra. So on the backdrop of the Punch terror attack and at a time when Bilawal Bhutto is going to come for the SCO sometime next week, Dr. Jaishankar reiterates that this nation is indulging in cross-border terrorism. There is now also a desperation from the jihadi tanzims that stands exposed. Ambassador Rajiv Dogra, how would you see this? Well, well, there's no doubt that after what happened in Rajori, where five of our jawans were uh, killed, uh, no one can rest easy in India. Uh, and the message that Pakistan has given is very blatant and very brutal. That terrorism will continue. The question for us is twofold. Number one, what to do with Bilawal Bhutto when he comes in? Uh, my response to that would be twofold. Number one, that we will not do what happened when Mr. Rajnath Singh went as Home Minister to Pakistan mm. and the Home Minister of Pakistan, that horrible man, uh, 
refused to attend his own lunch in honor of the delegates that he had invited. So India is not known for being uh, crude in its hospitality and being rude to people it has invited. So uh, the foreign minister of Pakistan, along with foreign ministers of other SEO member states, would participate in the deliberations. That is one. Second, whether there will be a pull aside or a bilateral meeting, well, that depends on how things develop between now and the actual SEO meeting. Mm. But the fact is that even at the worst of times, countries other than India, Pakistan, and even India, Pakistan, have engaged in some kind of a contact. There are reports that India and Pakistan had back channel talks going, uh, even during some of the worst incidents of terror. So uh, we have to wait whether some kind of a dialogue is going to help us achieve our objectives, uh, is going to help us convey our message uh, firmly, but uh, diplomatically, uh, since a guest from Pakistan See, has come. So it's a little ticklish question. Mm -hmm. We don't want them here, frankly, but it's SEO, it's not a bilateral and uh, there is no way after what Dr. Jaishankar has said today that there's going to be any engagement because if there is any engagement, then all these talk falls flat. But Mr. S.P. Ved, if the Tanzims are getting desperate for attention because the pie in terms of the money and share of attention is dropping, that also should worry us because these people will do something here. It's the innocents who will die and India will suffer. Yes, Anand, uh, yes, uh, what you said is absolutely right. There is desperation in the Tanjims to for one upmanship and uh, uh, see, as far as Poonch attack is concerned, PG, uh, the P, uh, PF has uh, already owned it. Uh, if Pakistan wants even slightest improvement uh, and uh, in relationship, it, it, it knows who are the people who have done it and it needs to take them into custody and hand them over to India or take action against them. See, uh, you can't pursue this policy of jihad against India. You can't pursue this policy of thousand cuts and uh, Gazbai Hin and expect India to talk to you. Talk what? Talk with whom? Hmm. Uh, who, who, who's engineering this? Uh, is it the deepest deep state? Is it the establishment or is it political uh, uh, leadership? And who, who who do we talk to? Who actually controls all this? So India needs to know this very, very clear. And uh, only then I think India should uh, move forward. Already, uh, you know, the, as far as ceasefire is concerned, uh, it was Pakistan who needed the ceasefire. And the offer came from them, India accepted it. If, as a good neighbor, but uh, we know it was their requirement because their Western Front was very active. Jay. And uh, uh, the Pakistan's intentions, I I note it, and you all note it, it, it has not changed. It continues to do what it was doing, even when uh, the uh, LOC was hot. Hmm. Uh, it continues to uh, drop uh, weapons, drugs. It continues to push the groups, and that's why you have a attack like what you saw. Uh, two days back in Punch. So uh, it, it's it, its agenda against India continues. Then what what are we gaining out of uh, uh, even ceasefire? Mm. So uh, let me uh, make it very clear. I think the, what uh, Dr. Jay Shankar said, absolutely, you can't uh, uh, deal with such a neighbor. It, it's so so difficult. Who, who's treacherous? Mm. Who says something and does something else? One should be very very clear. Okay, we have a policy of jihad against India, we will uh, continue this for thousand years, then we will face it. Hmm. But don't stretch and talk something else and uh, do something uh, behind the back. See, there is a desperation, sir, and uh, SP White Sahib and uh, Ambassador Raji Dogra, I just want to add another dynamic and dimension to this. We'll take this conversation beyond Pakistan and the terrorism aspect to a larger issue because strategically we, we find ourselves challenged at the UN. So I want you to, I request you to please stay back, uh, Mr. Vaid. And also I'd like your thoughts on this quickly. Uh, because what Ruchira Kamboj has said becomes very interesting at the UN. And I'm going to bring that dynamic. India sending out a very stern message at the UN. India's envoy to the UN, Ruchira Kamboj, alleging bias for five nations.
and questioning the effectiveness of multilateralism. She is asked, can we practice effective multilateralism by defending a charter that makes five nations more equal than the others and provides to each of those five the power to ignore the collective will of the remaining 188 member states? That's the veto power. The point and uh, time and again has been raised by India, that is reform the UN. First, let's listen to what Ruchira Kambod said and then we'll tell you why there's a need to reform the UN. Can we practice effective multilateralism by defending a charter that makes five nations more equal than others and provides to each of those five the power to ignore the collective will of the remaining 188 member states? India was a founding signatory to the UN Charter when it was signed on 26 June 1945 in San Francisco. 77 years later, when we see the world's largest democracy, the world's largest democracy along with entire continents of Africa and Latin America being kept out of global decision making, we rightly call for a major course correction. Let's, let's go back to uh, SPYG and Ambassador Rajiv Dogra. Mr. SPY, do you agree? This 75-year-old organization is a defunct in its current form. And if India yeah. needs to get anything done, there needs to be a complete overhaul of the UN. Absolutely. Ananji, I completely agree with our uh, permanent representative, what she said. Uh, uh, you look at today, India is the most populous country and the largest democracy in the world. And uh, look at there's absolutely no representation uh, from Africa, from Latin America and a country like India. Uh, I, I, and look at the performance of United Nations uh, la, uh, last few decades. Uh, you, uh, you, you saw uh, Russia-Ukraine war, how it is, how UN is being ineffective to uh, cut it as ceasefire and stop this war. Look at uh, terrorism, the way India is suffering and many other countries are suffering. Mm. Uh, what has the UN been uh, able to do? Look at uh, the, what happened uh, in during COVID. Ultimately, it was India's and India's Prime Minister's policy to distribute uh, a vaccine. Yeah. What was the role of UN? Uh, tell me, uh, could UN do much, whatever was expected from it? Mm. So, uh, look at the role of United Nations. I think it's high time India gives a, uh, a, a, a stern warning and I think she has done it very rightly. Otherwise, India needs to walk out of UN if they do not uh, give proper representation. That, that's the... That, that's the larger point, Ambassador Rajiv Dugra. Unless these veto powers are taken away from these five nations and there is equal representation for majority of the countries which today have changed the discourse. 75 years ago, the story was different. In the 50s, 60s, the story was different. Today's story is different. Most of these UN members are not even strong economic powers today. Well, absolutely. You are right. The story has changed, but the actors refuse to change and the reason why i say that is that in 1945 when the un was formed there were less than 50 member states today there are close to 200 countries in the world which are members of united nations second the power dynamic has changed take for example united kingdom mm. which is also one of the five uh, uh, countries which occupy the uh, global high table, the yeah. Security Council membership. Now, does it by any standard deserve that it is no longer the power that it was during the Second World War mm -hmm. or immediately thereafter? It is not even a member of European Union. So it can claim only to represent itself and soon it may not be able to represent even that united part of its name because Scotland wants to opt out. Correct. So it is like a big village which is taking upon itself a role which does not suit it any longer. Uh, so, But there are practical problems to it. This is not the first time that India has voiced its concern or other countries have voiced its con their concern that UN is not representative at all and UN has lost its uh, mojo, Gee. its, its uh, basic uh, wherewithal to have an effective voice in the world. It is just like a poodle of United States uh, in most major issues. Correct. So, uh, but the issue that India faces is countries like Pakistan, countries like China, 
countries like Italy, which are opposed to any move to expand the Security Council or to accommodate countries like India, Japan or Germany, which deserve rightfully a place yes. on the global high table. So it's going to be a long battle. But no, the I fact don't. is that despite or in spite of United Nations Security Council, India has a voice which is heard and counted in the world today. Yeah, but then it has to be made official. Otherwise, let's just get out of the UN and let's get all the other nations also to get out of the UN and until these uh, five nations go to heal because it cannot be a hegemony and five nations cannot have a veto power over the rest of the countries. Somewhere that seems very, very unfair in this changing face of things and you can't have multilateralism truly. I, to, uh, somewhere one, you know, echoes... Uh, with what Ruchira Kamboj had said there very beautifully. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time. Always wonderful speaking with you, putting matters into the right